Oh, I got some video, it looks like. I was able to get that. Um, I'm not sure that I've got microphone there, Yeah, you can tell the microphone. If you which, one, oh, which one is that? Can you guys hear me? Oh, he says they can hear me. Okay. All right. I think I might be okay. Okay. Share this. Yeah, I'll need to do that. Yeah. As soon as I get that open, I'll do that. So you open the file for it. Okay, sorry. No, no was... problem. I, you know, it helps to know somebody can run up and help <laughs> with stuff. Yeah, I appreciate I'm it. Glad to be that person. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I think I think we're good. If you want to get rid of that top slide, you can go into the dot 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 hide the post and you can control it down here. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. How is everybody? First week is going all right. Yes, no. Okay. We've got uh <laughs> Three graduate students that are joining us. Um, one of them, uh, Julia, is up in Jay at the West Florida Research and Education Center working with Dr. Emery, and then and a couple other people. And then we've got Patrick and Alejandra who are down in uh, Fort Lauderdale working with Dr. Marco Shivan. So they're taking the class as graduate students along with Ron. Um, and then the rest of you, are, of course, taking it at the undergraduate level. but we're going to be uh, having them join us through Zoom. Uh, that'll hopefully make it go smoothly and keep everybody engaged and give the op option to uh, interact. Um, Patrick, Julie, and Alejandra, do you guys have microphones that you can speak? Yeah, yeah. So, Patrick, uh, if you could yes. start, could you give just a brief, uh, just a brief introduction to yourself? Yeah, totally. Um... Hi, I'm Pat. I'm making lunch right now. I work for Dr. Schiavon, um, Marco. I do turf grass culture, um, environmental horticulture. Right now I'm working on using uh, wastewater for an irrigation source and I'm trying to see like how different fertilizers um, are being absorbed by plants uh, using different kinds of runoff. So we kind of test the gray water and we're just trying to see if like the carbonates and stuff like that are competing with the fertilizers and uh, actually just leaching into the soil or not. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah. Thank you. Julia? Hello, everyone. Um, so I am a new student here at J Station. I am working with entomology and turf grass system. So I have uh, my co-advisor, Dr. Brian Urak, is the turf grass, turf grass guy here at J. And my project's going to be involving uh, host plant resistant for turf grass with two uh, Lepidopter pests. Thank you. Alejandra? Yes, hello. Uh, as Pat, I'm working with uh, Dr. Schiavon, as Patrick is. I uh, just got here last week. I'll be working with Citra Blue St. Augustine Press um, in three different locations. And the idea is to determine like the idea <clears throat> fertilization and uh, mowing and the attaching of uh, these type of grass in three different locations. Awesome, thank you. Um, I shared with them that they're, when they get the, I'm trying to get the Canvas site up for the course this afternoon or tomorrow. Uh, Canvas is of course where we'll go through the 
quizzes each week. Uh, for those three of you that just joined us, I'll get the syllabus to you, but there'll be weekly quizzes to Canvas, uh, like we talked about on Monday. And the first one, of course, is kind of be cover some of this intro stuff and a little bit of what we talk about today. And uh, there'll be, they'll, like I said before, there'll be open book, uh, open, you know, use your notes, whatever you want. I'll get that uh, textbook PDF there for you as well. Uh, any questions about anything before we kind of jump into things today? Not too much. So the, um, con what we're gonna get into today is this will be started. At, first, I wanna kind of give you guys a little photo piece. So I want you to look at this picture and I want you to think about it for a minute and let, Tell me what you think is going on. Carl. Traffic. Traffic? No. Not a bad guess, but no. Uh, Do they have something like coloring for it? Nope. Like that map? Sydney? All right, Sydney. Is the irrigation not raising it? No. Good idea so far. Olivia? I would have guessed foot traffic. Foot traffic? Okay, so. The foot traffic, now we've got a couple, couple of thoughts on traffic, right? Traffic will wear grass out, but it won't make it go like dormant like this is right now. So foot traffic, you'll see it wear out, you'll see it thin out, but it won't make it go dormant like it is right now. Ron? Is there some sort of like trench thing underneath the ground there? Oh, we're getting really closer. Down. Not not exactly. Now I'm going to show you another. Uh, uh, Julia or Patrick or Alejandra, any ideas? You can ask me questions about the picture. Maybe nematodes, insect pressure, herbicide drift. Okay, not bad, not bad guesses, but no. Would be something like covering that area, like the chlorification or something with the pigmentation of the grass. Something that was maybe sprayed on it. You, you're saying? Um, I've seen some something similar like this when the area was covered, like for events oh, and something. So it was it was not covered with anything. So maybe some other type of uh, soil pest? No. So a different type of soil? Not. Soil pest? Like yeah. rubs? No. No. It so could be show you um, another picture in the same area. It could be a uh, what's it called when it dries out and it gets hydrophobic. Could be, but look at this picture in comparison to the first one. Mm. What have we done oh. in this picture? Inverse. <laughs> Complete flip of it, right? Seasons change. Ah, so now we're getting somewhere. Ron said the seasons change. Sydney? Are they different species? They are. And that's they are different species. Going going at a different time. So this picture was taken on the Iowa State campus, Names, Iowa. Okay. And the picture, oops, I need to go to the back button, not that one. The first picture was taken in. I, I believe this was late fall, all right? Getting into, not to where we had snow yet, but it was getting cold. Second picture was taken in the middle of summer. And what we have in this situation is exactly what was said, two different species of grass. We've got a, uh, we've got warm, our cool season grasses over here that are dormant in the middle of summer. When it's hot, they don't have irrigation on these fields and they go dormant. And warm season grasses that are planted here that are thriving because right along this is a steam tunnel. So there's a steam tunnel buried on campus through that middle of that field that keeps the soil warmer and gives the warm season grasses a chance to thrive during and survive the winters there because it the root zones don't get cold enough to kill them off entirely. And it gives them a competitive advantage then in, against the cool season grasses. Because in a situation where warm and cool season will grow together, warm season will outcompete cool season almost every time because they're, they are more aggressive. They grow laterally more quickly. They grow more, they just grow more quickly. And so in this particular situation, we have 
a little microclimate type thing going on here that has given us this really sort of dramatic example of the difference between a warm and cool season grass. Now, we're going to get into some of the details of how the warm and cool season grasses thrive, where they thrive in terms of climate. But this is one of the things that you can you will see, particularly when you get up into the Midwest, we call it the transition zone we'll talk about in a little bit, where it's really too cold for warm season grasses to thrive year round and too hot during periods of the year for cool season grasses to thrive year round. So the situation here in the, uh, when we go into the winter, fall and winter months, the temperatures get colder and the warm season grasses go dormant as their survival mechanism. Now that doesn't mean there isn't plenty of time to be out there enjoying those surfaces because you know, whether it's a home lawn or, or something else, they, they don't have snow cover for quite a while, but it's still cold enough that they go dormant. I had a, I spent about three years at the, uh, at an extension office up in Wisconsin. And I had a homeowner come into me that was trying to help their neighbor and they brought in a sample of grass. And the context of the situation was that there's this, her yard is dead most of the year and they'd gone out and put fungicides on it and all this stuff. They couldn't get it to green up. And then, you know, just middle of the summer, all of a sudden it looks better. And then again, it dies. And so he'd been trying to help her and trying to help her to get it so that it would stay green like the rest of the yards in the area. When they brought it in, it was zoysia grass. So they had planted their yard to zoysia grass. And in just outside of Green Bay, Wisconsin, it was climate that was enough, mild enough that the zoysia grass would survive. But it was only green for about two or three months of the summer. And the rest of the time it was dormant. And in that particular climate, that dormant period was a pretty large chunk of the time of the season where everyone else's yards were green. And so they were looking at it, they were trying to treat it as a cool season grass, thinking something was wrong with it. When in fact, it just could not grow during the time of the year they were expecting it to grow. So when we look at, uh, let me get rid of this for a minute, or at least move it off the side. Talk about turf grasses as a system. You know, they're plants that form more or less a contiguous ground cover. I think we're all kind of, familiar with the idea of a turf grass or a lawn or an athletic field, golf course. You've got a community of plants that produce this dense green cover. And if it's healthy and growing well, it's pretty much, you know, a 100% cover. This inner, uh, we turf, you know, it's this, when we refer, refer to turf as like the community, then it's this interconnecting community of all these together. And turf management, is this range of activities and cultural practices that we put into maintaining these systems. So we talk about it, you know, a turf grass plant or a, a turf area. And then we talk about turf grass management, which is the, everything from the selection of grass that we plant into that site, using the proper establishment uh, practices for those grasses that we pick, mowing them, fertilizing them, irrigating them, using the right aerification and things to, to help that community thrive, have a healthy root system, healthy canopy that meets the needs of use for that site. Um, turf has a lot of different functions that you can, that it can be used for. You know, there's very utilitarian type functions uh, like soil stabilization. Um, we see this on roadsides and construction sites where, or any roadsides and construction sites where yeah, well, roadsides, it's kind of two things. It's one, it's stabilizing the soil. There's also a safety factor on roadsides. Um, because if you were, look at, were to look at turf versus other plants along a roadside, what are a lot of the other plants that would potentially grow along a roadside? A lot of them tend to be more vertical growing weeds or things like that, right? They grow higher than what the turf does. And they don't handle mowing, which we'll get to in a little bit, but they don't handle mowing without it actually killing the plant in most cases. So not only does it stabilize the roadside, but it provides this area between the road and the trees or the median or whatever case that if a vehicle actually happens to go off the road, they don't just run into something that's going to you know, potentially cause harm. There's a, a safety barrier there. You think about going down the interstate, there's 40 or 60 feet there of grass that if a vehicle accidentally goes off the road, they're not immediately in the trees. Uh, it provides soil stabilization in those cases so that that surface, when you go off the road, 
doesn't erode and cause ruts that would, you know, if you were to go off the road and your vehicle started to slide sideways and hit a rut, you'd be at a higher risk of rolling over, right? But because you've got that turf there that really provides kind of a stable surface of that soil, prevents erosion. Now, if you start to slide sideways, there's a chance that you'll slide instead of roll because of hitting a rut with the water running off the side of the road. Um, on airports, if you pretty much any airport that you've probably ever flown in or out of, the runways are all surrounded by turf grass plants of some sort. Those are there for a couple reasons. One is to, again, prevent wind erosion and dust, which can cause a lot of problems for the aircraft. The dust is taken up and sucked into the engines. It causes you know, more wear and tear on the engines. And it also can help with controlling wildlife in those areas. Because if you keep it mowed down, it doesn't provide the cover that birds and things like might like to have. And if they can try to, well, birds are obviously a big concern on, on airports. They don't want to be sucking birds into the engines as they're trying to take off with the jet. So they, the turf provides this sort of artificial community, if you will, that they can control the types of wildlife that are there and try to minimize those risks. Recreationally, um, of course, we use turf in our uh, athletic fields and golf courses. Uh, you might even consider, you know, depending on your particular situation, the turf in your backyard being used for recreation. You know, you see people that have large backyards and they put up you know, small little baseball fields, or they'll play football or basketball, or, or I mean, football and soccer back there with the kids. Um, or it may be ornamental, purely for aesthetic reasons, right? The landscape around our residential and commercial buildings has a big impact the way it looks in terms of how it's viewed and valued aesthetically. And turf is an important component of that. It doesn't, it's the only component of it. It is not the only component of that landscape, but it is an important component that plays a role in, in creating this value, whether it's home value or, or just aesthetic value for those landscapes. Talking about, now you're gonna, we're gonna, you're going to hear me talk about some of these things when we talk about the different grasses as we go through the semester. And so we're gonna try to familiarize with some of, the, some of these terms so that when we mention them, you kind of have an idea what we're talking about. I'm gonna mention turf density with some of the plants. And we talked a little bit about, about that on, uh, I think on Monday, referring to a couple of the grasses. But when we talk about density, it's the unit, you know, how, how many shoots per unit area there are. Now we won't get into details of how many, specifically how many shoots there are per unit area for a given grass, but we will talk about something, who has, something that has a higher density or a lower density, or how management or use impacts density. So when we talked about that, well, those pictures, we talked about foot traffic. What do you think foot traffic does to the density of a turf? makes it go down, right? It wears out that canopy and it decreases the density. Now foot traffic also compacts the soil. Vehicle traffic does the same thing. And even if you remove the traffic and the wear, the compaction of the soil can have an impact on the density because now you've impacted that plant's ability to take up water and nutrients from the soil. And so it won't grow as well with that compacted soil and density will typically decline. If you live in a neighborhood, I. I see this occasionally. I lived in a neighborhood on the west side of town called Belmont for a number of years. And it was managed by a homeowners association. I hired a landscape management crew to come in and mow the yards. And they would mow all the front yards with a zero turn mower. And they made the same path across the yard every time. And over time, where those wheels went from yard to yard to yard in the same exact path every time, the grass grew differently in those wheel paths than it did anywhere around it because of the compaction that was happening to that soil. It wasn't enough, it wasn't wear, because they're only just driving across it once a week. It was the compaction impacting the way the plant was growing. So you can see that in some cases in people's yards if they have a backyard where they maybe go and park a boat, where you know they're not, they're not driving across it so often that you're getting physical wear to the plant. It's the compaction of the soil by those vehicles going back and forth in the same location that can change how the plant grows and it'll change some of its morphology in some cases, how the how dense it is and how it looks. Turf grass density is going to be a function of species. You know, if you look at St. Augustine grass versus Bermuda grass, St. Augustine grass is going to have a lower density than Bermuda grass on a shoot per unit area basis because it has a coarser leaf texture. 
uh, cultivar fertility, mowing heights, as we, within an acceptable range, and we'll talk about this again, but within an acceptable range for a given grass, it's tolerable mowing height. The higher you mow the, the grass, the lower the density. As you mow lower, your density will increase typically until you get below what that grass is able to handle for its tolerance in mowing height. And then the, de the density starts to decrease. So all these kind of come into play texture. Uh, this one's fairly straightforward. Coarser textured grasses have a lower texture uh, or, or, you know, when you've got the wider leaf blades, grasses like San Augustine, uh, Bahia grass have a coarse texture and the finer texture grasses like some of our zoysia grasses and Bermuda grasses have a, a finer texture. In the cool season grasses, that would be the tall fescues that would typically have a coarser texture in many cases. Although the, the newer turf types we'll talk about uh, tend to blend pretty well with the other grasses. And then we've got on the other extreme, the fine fescues, which are really, really almost like needle-like leaves. They're really, really fine textured leaves. Uniformity. Now, when we step back and look at a stand of grass, is it uniform? We're talking that it can be a function of the uh, number of weeds that are in that canopy. So if you've got a, a nice, clean, uniform canopy, think something like Florida Field or the baseball stadium or something like that, where it's basically weed-free, it's a consistent color, consistent texture, and looks basically like a, a nice, smooth carpet. That's something that has a high uniformity. As you add weeds into that, as you add bare spots where maybe something uh, came in and killed some of the grass, dried out, whatever the case, now your uniformity starts to decline, okay? Smoothness. This, uh, anything that affects the surface uh, of the turf and changes its appearance visually can impact the smoothness of it. Uh, I'm dealing with this over here. Oops. Uh, this over here in my yard right now. What could cause that? Yeah, dull mower blade, where it shreds the leaf tips rather than cutting them cleanly. Uh, so I noticed when I went to mow a couple nights ago that particularly on the Bahia grass, I had about a half inch of shredded leaf tip on the ends of the blades. St. Augustine grass wasn't as bad. Both cut with the same mower the same day. Because the Bahia grass leaves tend to be a little bit tougher and, and more fibrous than what the St. Augustine grass is. So the St. Augustine grass with the same mower blade cuts cleaner than what the Bahia grass does. Zoysia grass has a very fibrous, stiff leaf blade and is really hard to cut and would really shred badly with a, a dull mower. Uh, so, you know, the, the, what you see in the canopy can be a function of something that's completely unrelated to the grass itself. It can be something that you're actually doing to it. Uh, when you talk about smoothness here, it could be something from the standpoint of mowing. It could be the traffic we were talking about changing the way the grass grows. Um, it could be where a pet has gone out there and left their dog spot. You know, they pee in the yard and the grass grows more quickly where the dog urinated in the yard because of the nitrogen that comes from that. And you've got a lack of uniformity, right? Because now you've got grass that's growing quicker around everything else because it's received more nitrogen and it looks different. Fairy ring can be an example where that fairy ring fungus changes the way it looks and changes the uniformity of it. Because it, as it's breaking down the organic matter, releasing nitrogen into the soil, you get a growth flush of dark green grass where the fairy ring is active. And then in some cases you'll see, depending on the fairy ring, uh, a dead ring inside of it where the grass has died back. And that's impacting the uniformity. Turf grass color. Now color is an interesting thing from my standpoint, when we talk about turf grass systems, uh, by show of hands, who prefers the grass on the left? Who, should, who prefers the grass on the right? Which one of you is right? Neither, right? Personal preference. We talk about turf grass color. Per, turf grass color, in a large part, is a personal preference. It's a it's a very subjective thing. Just because one's dark green or lighter green, if we're talking about two different species or cultivars of grass, 
it doesn't mean one's better than the other, right? Because we have genetic differences in color. It doesn't matter in some cases. This is two different cultivars of St. Augustine grass. No matter what you do to this grass on the right, it'll never be the same color as the grass on the left. Okay, when we're talking about genetic differences. Now, if we have a monoculture stand of a Floritam or Celebration Bermuda grass or something like that, and we see these different colors, we see some that are a little lighter green or more lime green, and we see some areas that are darker green. Now, if we know that the grass is all the same, we look at that color and that can help us determine that maybe there's something else going on that's causing the change in color. So that can be something that kind of helps us down the path of, oh, well, we want this to look more uniform. And if it's a little bit chlorotic, looking a little bit yellow, what could be some things that would lead to that? It could be wet soils. It could be low fertility. It could be different light quantity. So, you know, when we, we talk about this uh, with uh, cultivar evaluations and things like that, and uh, this is, again, a very subjective thing. The market for turf in the United States tends to lend itself to preferring more like the things on the left. And interestingly, the, the market for turf grasses in Europe tends to prefer more of the grasses on the right. They like a little bit more of the lime green or, or, or in my opinion, sort of a brighter green color. And in the United States, the breeders tend to focus more on the darker green uh, cultivars and find that those do better in the market uh, in the United States. Growth habit. When we start uh, talking about identifying grasses, growth habit's gonna be one of the things that are really important for you to know for each of the grasses to help you determine which grass you're looking at. There's three basic types of growth habit with turf grasses. There's bunch type, which would be the uh, example here on the left, where these are typically seeded type grasses uh, and typically well, really almost exclusively for turf grass, uh, cool season grasses that would be bunch type with the exception of our warm season weeds like crabgrass, that can be bunch type grasses, but they're not really something we manage as a turf. They're a weed in our turf. But the turf grasses we maintain, the only bunch type grasses that we would come across are typically going to be in the cool season category. Um, and then we have rhizomes and stolons. So the rhizomatous grasses, stoloniferous grasses, or grasses that can be both rhizomatous and stoloniferous. Does everybody know what a rhizome and stolon is? So if we, uh, if we look at, drag this over just for a little bit, hopefully we can. Let's see if I can. Yeah, it didn't help. I'll do it right here. Okay. So if we look at a plant and it's growing in the soil, okay? Stolons are going to grow laterally across the ground and they will have chlorophyll in them. Okay, so they'll be green. So stolons are gonna have chlorophyll and be green. They have nodes where new shoots and roots can come out. And they typically like St. Augustine grass is probably one that you're really familiar with where you see this growing laterally across the ground from like the edge of a sidewalk or into a landscape bed or something like that. Rhizomatous grasses, we take that same turf grass plant, they have a very similar looking structure. It looks almost identical. It's a stem that grows underground. Okay, it stays below the soil. And it also has nodes where it can produce new shoots and roots. But this stem will be cream colored, okay? It's going to be like a light tan or cream colored stem. It will, will not have chlorophyll in it. Uh, when we look at the grasses that we have, cool season grasses that we talk about, some of them are stoloniferous like creeping bent grass. Uh, some of them are rhizomatous like Kentucky bluegrass. Some of them are bunch type. 
when we get into the warm season grasses that we manage in the landscape, they're either going to be stoloniferous rhizomatous, or well, they'll either be stoloniferous or stoloniferous and rhizomatous. So we have things like San Augustine grass, centipede grass, carpet grass that are stoloniferous. We have bahia grass, Bermuda grass, Deloisia grass. Well, bahia grass, I apologize, bahia grass is rhizomatous, it doesn't have stolon. And then Bermuda grass, Deloisia grass, seashore vespalum have both stolons and rhizomes. So knowing and being able to recognize the growth habit can be helpful for identifying the grass again. Functional quality, rigidity. Basically, how stiff is that canopy? And this is something that for games like golf can be a really important function in terms of how well and how easy that canopy is going to play for the golfers that are out there. Golfers tend to like something that's going to hold the ball up so that they can get their club under it a little bit more easily. And that will help them. That, that, you know, grasses that tend to lay a little more flat or they have a softer canopy like on the right, where the ball gets down closer to the ground can make it a little bit more difficult for the, for the game of golf. Uh, this can also come into play with things like soccer, where you have a lot of interaction with the ball and the surface of the turf and a nice smooth, firm surface like the one on the left, the ball will typically roll across that a little more quickly and easily, where if it's rolling through the grass and the grass is giving as it goes across it, it's gonna slow the ball down. So the ball on a, on a turf that's like this on the right, the game will play slower because the ball doesn't go as far and it doesn't go as fast. So it can impact how the game is played. We actually see turf grass managers in some cases manipulate things like this for things like soccer, where if they know, for instance, you know, on cool season grasses, if we look at cool season versus warm season grasses, cool season grasses are gonna be a lot more similar to the, this on the right, where they have a softer canopy. And teams that come from northern climates to play in cool season grasses typically play the ball in the air more than they do on the ground because they know that the ball is going to slow down as it rolls through the grass. When places like the University of Florida bring in a team that's going, that they're going to be playing against that typically plays in cool season grasses, they will in some cases shorten the height of cut, particularly if they know it's going to be a competitive game and they know that they need to have some sort of advantage in there. It will shorten the height of cut a little bit to tighten that canopy, canopy up more, make it faster, because they're already used to playing on a fast surface where their, competitive, their competitor comes in and is used to playing on a slow surface. And they will try to give themselves a little bit of an advantage by changing the field conditions in preparation for some of these events. The same thing happens going the other way. When teams from the South go play up North, I've heard of athletic field managers being asked to not mow the grass because they're already used to playing the, ground, the ball on the ground more. And if they let that canopy grow a little bit extra, it's gonna slow the ball down even more than what they used to do. So it's, it's a way that can be, you know, it's something that can be used to change the game a little bit. That's not really, you know, it's not a rule that they're breaking in, in any situation, but they're changing the conditions of the turf, to try to favor the playing conditions, of, you know, or change the playing conditions in their favor. <laughs> you said it's dirty, Ron? Yeah. Yeah. What did you say? It seems like it should just be considered like cheating. It's kind of like with Tom Brady when he has to deflate his ball. <laughs> like it sounds like the same thing. It, it probably could be considered cheating. And you know, I mean, if you wanted to look at it as a, in that sense, I, and I don't know how widespread it is, but I know I've, sp I've spoken to field managers that have been asked to do things like that where they've, manipulated things a little bit. It's not like you're gonna go in and play in a pasture, right? That they let it grow up six inches tall. But if you add a quarter of an inch to the height of something that's already going to play slower than what you're used to, it would have a pretty big impact on how that field plays. And, and some of that, you know, some of that's already gonna be part of the game anyway, because you're already going into a, a surface that's going to play slower than what you're used to. And they're just making it that much slower. So, when we look at rigidity of the grasses within the cool season grasses, the tall fescues will typically have a, 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 the most rigidity or the stiffest canopy down to the bent grasses, which typically are the softest canopy. They're really sort of soft pliable leaves. And on uh, the warm season side, we go from zoysia grass at the top. When you walk across zoysia grass, how many of you have known you're walking across zoysia grass? 
what would you describe it as if you if you had any words to describe it? Spongy, okay. So it, ten, it can be it can be sort of a it's mowed generally in residential landscapes at the same height or very similar heights as St. Augustine grass, but it has this really dense thick canopy. And when I when I walk across it, it's, it sounds like I'm walking on straw. It has this real kind of crunchy sound when you walk across it because that canopy is so rigid. And the stones that are there and the stems that are there, it's a very rigid canopy. It does get thatchy and that can lead to the sort of spongy feel that you feel in it. But uh, if you compare it to St. Augustine grass, it's a, it's a dense canopy that has a lot of rigidity. So you get that resistance and sort of feel of give when you walk across it, it gives that spongy feel, but it also is very crunchy and, and sounds stiff when you walk, it, walk on it. Uh, down to things like carpet grass, which are very soft. You know, it's a very soft sort of canopy compared to a lot of our warm season grass. Elasticity. We won't talk a lot about elasticity with regard to the grasses, but know that elasticity, this ability of the grass to bounce back up after it's been pushed over is something that you can pay attention to with things like water stress. A canopy that's under water stress, it may not show signs of wilting, but if you walk across it, your footprints don't bounce back up right away. They kind of stay there and it'll, it'll slowly sort of come back because the grass isn't as rigid, the cells aren't full at the same trigger pressure as they are when it's a well-watered plant. So a, a drought stressed turf will have lower elasticity than one that's well watered. Resiliency, this has more to do with the, the uh, soil surface under that plant than it does with the canopy itself. And it's the ability to absorb shock from whether it's a footprint or something falling on it, a wheel driving across it, and not leave a rut or a dent in that, that the topography of that soil base. Okay. Now, when you have a bunch type grass, the resiliency of those canopies tends to be a little bit lower. When we have this network of rhizomes and stolons, or one or the other, the resiliency tends to be a little bit higher because that network of stem tissue tends to help support that result in less deformation when something impacts it and a little bit better ability for that, plant, that, that surface to rebound from whatever happens to go across it. The verdure, funny word, and not something you may come across a lot, but when we mow, we remove the clippings and leave the verdure. About as easy as I can and put it. So the verdure is the, the part of the plant that's left after we mow. The clippings are what we cut off. All right. Not a term that we'll probably use a lot beyond today, but uh, know that if that pops up on a quiz, the verdure is the part that's left after you mow. The clippings are what we remove or cut off. All right, rooting, why is rooting important? So the speed at which a plant's able to produce roots could, could impact how quickly it's able to establish. Is that what you're getting at, Ron? Absolutely, because what, root, what do roots do for the plants? Water and nutrients, they hold the plant in place, right? Um, prevent erosion so that it get, the plant doesn't get washed out. The uh, amount of root development in the plant is a function of a lot of different things. It's a function of the mowing height of the plant, of the grass. It's a function of the root zone and any, any limiting layers that might be in the root zone. So we can have different situations that we'll, we'll talk about some of these later that can impact root depth. Some of it can be soil compaction. It can be differences in soil texture. There can be rooting uh, implications from things like insect feeding. White grubs are an example of things that feed on the roots of the plants and impact the rooting of that plant. You've got a compromised root system. You've got reduced water and nutrient uptake. You have plants that are gonna be more susceptible to drought stress. 
and nutrient deficiencies. That compromised root system could be anything from, I mentioned insects, it can be nematode damage, it can be fungal pathogens, right? It could be any of those that impact the healthy or the ability of that plant to develop a healthy root system. Now, as turf grass managers, we try to manipulate the system in a way to give that plant a healthy, the chance to produce a healthy root system. We monitor for things like insect pests that are gonna feed on the roots and treat them if and when they become present. We look for signs of disease. We try to manage compaction and we try to irrigate and, and make sure that we're not leaving the grass standing in, you know, in standing water. Because if we have a saturated root zone, grass plants in general don't like growing into saturated root zones and that can impact water. So drainage becomes an important part of managing a turf grass. You have low-lying areas that stay ponded you're going to have compromised root systems, higher disease pressure, higher insect pressure, and a plant that's more susceptible to problems. When we look at recuperative capacity, and I will make these slides available, you don't have to write all these things down, um, but there's kind of the, the, the different breakdown of them. Things like drooping bent grass have a higher recuperative capacity than fine fescue and perennial, perennial ryegrass on the cool season side, because creeping bent grass is a stoloniferous grass that grows laterally. If you have something that damages that canopy, it's going to be able to fill into that and fill those voids more quickly than a bunch type grass like fine fescue or perennial ryegrass. Kentucky bluegrass has rhizomes. That's why it's near the top of the list. It can grow laterally into those voids and fill in and recuperate any damage from any damage that occurs. On this side of the, with the warm season grasses, we have Bermuda grass at the top with good recuperative capacity, zoysia grass on the bottom. Zoysia grass, according to some, is defined as one of the world's worst weeds because it does grow laterally and, and aggressively very quickly. So it has a high recuperative capacity. Zoysia grass, on the other hand, grows very, very slowly. So even though it has rhizomes and stolons, its slow growth habit means that it's going to have a slower or lower recuperative capacity. And the rest of these kind of fall out here in the middle. Functional quality. What would define functional quality? If you've got disease and insect tolerance and stress tolerance there, but what ultimately is going to define functional quality of a grass, you think, for a turf grass system? use, right? The functional quality is going to be a function primarily of the use or the expectations of that of that surface. You can have two of the exact same turf grasses, same species and cultivar growing in two different areas. If one area doesn't receive any traffic and has full sun, and one area is receiving moderate to, to heavy traffic, that where that's happening to that Bermuda grass, if we talk about Bermuda grass in a heavy traffic area, is going to have a different level of functional quality that comes from it because of the traffic, right? It's gonna have wear to the canopy, thinning of that canopy, uh, maybe uh, more uh, voids that need to re recover from, and that functional quality is going to decline. It's going to be more susceptible to stress because of the soil compaction that's happening. So to alleviate some of that, and improve the functional quality, we have to consider the use. If it's an area that's not receiving a lot of traffic, not receiving a lot of compaction, the amount of effort and work that we put in to maintain the functional quality we need is going to be different than an area that's receiving a lot of traffic. We may be able to achieve the same goal in both places. We may be able to achieve the same end appearance and aesthetic value that we're looking for, but because of the use, one's going to take more than the other. That makes sense. So we look at at Florida field, and that and compare that to maybe a high school uh, football field. That you so Florida field they've got separate practice facilities. They're the only team that uses that field. They use it, you know, what six or eight games a year or whatever, and it's not touched any other time, right? You take that same tiff tough Bermuda grass and you move it over to uh, uh, the name just Citizens Field over on the east side of town. 
where multiple high schools use that facility for games. To maintain the same level of cover, the same level, level playability, and the same appearance, one of those fields is going to require more input. And that's going to be the one that's getting more use. Not that you can't. Now, there's a point in use where, with a natural curve grass system, you may no longer be able to keep up with the traffic or the wear. Or if it's if you have an event that happens during a rain, uh, a rain event, and you've got basically almost saturated conditions, you can destroy a field no matter how much use it's had or hasn't had. But that, all things being equal, without any sort of extenuating circumstances, the field or surface that's use, receiving more wear and tear and use will require more inputs to achieve the same level of quality or the same level of uh, functional aesthetic value. I'm going to kind of just go through this real quickly, um, just because I want you to understand this idea of the phytomer for a plant, the turf grass plants specifically, and this really applies even more specifically to the warm season grasses, because it kind of comes into play when we talk about establishing grasses and how we establish some of our warm season grasses uh, through uh, uh, what we call sprigging, and we'll get into that when we talk about establishment, but when we look at a plant, turfgrass plant in particular, there's this idea of a phytomer. And when we look at this now, so if we were to take a stem from a warm season plant where the leaf is growing off of it, and, and it, we've got a stolen that's maybe growing across the ground. And you guys leave here, find a St. Augustine grass uh, growing across the sidewalk and, and pull up a stem and, and look at it or and so what you'll find is the leaf blade, right? And as you follow the leaf blade down to where it meets the stem, we talked about this a little bit on Monday, right? Where is this leaf blade vascularly connected to the rest of the plant? The vascular connection is actually right here at this node, okay? So this is the sheath, which is actually an extension of that leaf blade. This is all one vascular piece all the way down to where it connects to the node right here. Now, what's unique about the nodes? They can produce both shoots and roots, right? They've got the, the, uh, the apical meristematic tissue there to produce both shoots and roots from those nodes. Now, when we follow that stem down to the next node, this entire piece, so if we've got two nodes with the leaf blade, this is our phytomer, okay? So this plant, if we have a minimum of this, if we've got the two nodes here and a leaf blade, we can actually re reproduce that plant from just that little bit of leaf tissue or that little bit of plant tissue. We've got the nodes there to produce roots and shoots and a leaf blade that will give it a, a hopefully a head start on producing the photosynthate that it needs for growth. Um, in a lot of cases, even if you just have the node without any leaf blade, if you've got a healthy node, you can produce a new plant because it'll produce the shoots and roots from that. Now, we use that concept and, and that understanding of plant growth in establishment, particularly of warm season grasses, when we talk about sprigging. Is anybody familiar with sprigging? A couple of you? Carl, what is sprigging? Quite literally, right? Yeah. So, so we'll, when we talk about establishment, we'll get into establishment in an, another section, but we establish by seed, sod, or sprig, or, or plugs, right? Plugs are literally a complete potted plant, basically, that we plant in the ground and let it grow out from that. Sod, we establish a turf grass community on a farm somewhere. We literally harvest that sod in sections, pick it up, and just transplant it somewhere else. Instant grass, right? Sprigging, they go into things, particularly like Bermuda grass is, is one of the primary ones, see short class found, you can do it, though it's not often as done. done. Um, but they go in and they harvest, essentially harvest sod, or they have special machines, machines that will do this, and they shred the, stones and rhizomes and get the dirt off of them. So you're just left with that stem material and the nodes. And they will take a small area 
that's a dense plant turfgrass community, shred it into small bits, spread that out over a larger area. We do what's called cutting, which is pushing those stems down into the soil to get soil contact with the nodes. And then we keep it wet for a while so that as it produces the new roots and shoots, it can get water right away and we can produce a new plant community by, by taking this you know, dense plant community, shredding it, spreading out the larger area. And it tends to be a lot less expensive way of establishing versus sod. Because you can take you know, small areas and cover a much larger area. It's not a one-to-one -one coverage. The leaves, hopefully at this point, you understand that the leaves are the primary place of uh, food production in the plant through what process? Photosynthesis, right? Is this new information to anybody? Hopefully not. Hopefully not at this point. Um, chlorophyll is part of that, right? Now, what, what does chlorophyll also do for us in terms of the canopy? Not only does it provide a critical role in photosynthesis, but what does it also give us? The green color, right? So when we talk about plant nutrition later this semester, we're going to talk about things that can cause chlorosis when we talk about nutrient deficiency. So chlorosis is what? It's a yellowing of the canopy, right? It's a something that has caused the chlorophyll content in that plant to decline. Magnesium deficiencies can be a, a really big problem with causing chlorosis. Why would magnesium cause a problem with chlorosis? It's deficient. Magnesium is one of the central uh, uh, ions or part, uh, units in the chlorophyll. So if you don't have enough magnesium, you're not the plant won't be able to produce enough chlorophyll. Um, then we have things like nitrogen and other things that can cause chlorosis because they impact the ability of the plant to produce some of those steps up to chlorophyll production. Right or energy transfer or things like that. So we'll talk about nutrient deficiencies and the impact on the plant, um, but the leaves end up being something we look at a lot to help us diagnose problems. And if we can understand some of what we're seeing, it can help us understand maybe what the problems are as we're looking at it, trying to diagnose and figure out how to fix it. A lot of what we do in turf is trying to maintain a certain level of either functional or aesthetic quality. And that requires us in many cases to understand what causes those changes in the plant community. You know, if we see a yellowing chlorotic sort of color in the canopy, we've got to be thinking about, well, is it a nutrient deficiency? Is it saturated soils? Is it something going on in the root, root system? We've got to think about it holistically and understand what could change to cause that result. It could be something as simple as soil pH. We have a high pH soil. What happens with high pH soils in, in like bedding plants and things like that? What's typical nutrient deficiency that we see in high pH soils? Any of you know? Iron, iron deficiency, iron chlorosis, which in a broadleaf plant, it shows up as interveinal chlorosis, where the veins will be dark green, but the areas between the veins will start to turn yellow and eventually die back. In turf, it's harder to see interveinal chlorosis. You'll see an iron deficiency just as a general chlorotic response. So, you know, because we've got this monocly uh, uh, cotyledon plant with parallel veins, we don't have interveinal space really like we do on a dicot plant. So the, the response is the same, but it just looks differently in a monocot than it does a dicot. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that slide. Morphology. We will talk a lot about the vernation. We'll talk about veination a little bit with some of the grasses. But what I want you to take away from this is that our grasses are typically going to be either rolled or folded in terms of vernation. Okay? That's when the newly emerging leaf is coming from the plant. It will either be folded in half or rolled. Uh, the veins, well, there will be a couple of grasses. We'll talk about the veins in some of the, particularly in some of the cool season grasses, uh, the veins can be really prominent on the leaf surface and that can help us from an ID, ID standpoint. 
but from the standpoint of like aesthetic value, functional value, or anything like that, the, the veins don't, the veination of it doesn't really matter. Uh, neither does the vernation. These are more from ID, uh, us being able to ID the plants, okay? Um, that's sort of the bunch type grasses down here. We talked about, we talked about rhizomatous and stoloniferous plants being able to spread laterally, right? With rhizomes and stolons. Right. Bunch type grasses do spread laterally very slowly through a process of tillers that emerge next to the mother plant. Okay, so when this first seed, seed germinates and you've got the mother plant that grows up, after it gets to a certain point, it will actually produce a new shoot or daughter plant right next to the mother plant. And that emerges right next to that bunch. Now what happens over time, and you can see this with bunch type grasses, is what starts as a single plant will eventually get bigger and bigger and bigger, but it doesn't spread laterally, it just the bunch gets larger. And that's through the formation of these tillers right next to the main plant. And each of those tillers as they get older can produce their own tillers. So that's how bunch type grasses will typically spread out. Um, when we look at establishing cool season grasses, they're, you know, they're not planted so that it's 100% coverage. They're planted in, well, in the case of like perennial ryegrass, you want 20 to 25 seeds in the area of like a quarter. So, you know, if you're getting a, a seed density of, of about like that, you're going to have a portion of those that don't germinate, of course, and eventually those will, will fill in and grow and produce a, a dense canopy. We have Kentucky bluegrass, <coughs> which is a rhizomatous grass. We actually go for a lower seeding rate, lower seed coverage. Why? Because it has rhizomes and will actually spread out and grow in from the rhizomes and fill in. The bunch type grasses, because they can't fill in laterally, we have higher seeding rates. Rhizomatous grasses, if we're seeding them, have lower seeding rates because they will fill in and, and fill those voids on their own. Uh, the crown of the plant is something that is right at the base of the plant. Now, grasses in general, we have a certain small group of them that we can mow and others that we can't. Corn is an example of a grass that we can't mow. Why? Because as that corn plant grows, the meristematic tissue of the plant comes up above the ground. So if we cut off the corn plant, Below that meristematic tissue, we've killed the plant. The grasses that we're able to maintain as turf grasses keep the crown of the plant at or, or below the surface of the soil so they escape mowing. So when we come in and mow, we don't damage the crown. Now, if anything happens to damage the crown of a plant, a turf grass plant, it will often kill that plant. So when we look at things like bunch type turf grasses that have that one single crown for that one plant. And we have foot traffic, maybe it's you know cleats from an athlete or, or a, a mower that happens to scalp and cut into that crown. It'll kill those plants. Once that crown is damaged, it's dead. But as long as it escapes mowing, it isn't damaged, it's able to thrive. With the warm season grasses that have these nodes, stolons and rhizomes, we can damage one growing point and still have a whole bunch around it from that same plant that can fill in and recover. The crowns give rise to the new leaves, roots, tillers, and lateral stems. They serve as storage organs for carbohydrates. Rhizomes and stolons also store carbohydrates for the plant. Uh, that's not something I really care about. So the uh, rhizomes here, rhizomes and stolons both contribute to sod strength. Now, if you look at sod that you can harvest and, and, and purchase, you won't see tall fescue as an example or a, or a stand of perennial ryegrass available as sod. Why? Because they're bunched up grasses. We see rhizomatous or rhizomatous and stoloniferous grasses available as sod because that network of rhizomes and stolons allows us to cut those off below the ground and they will hold themselves together. Now I say that, and there's always an exception to the rule, right? 
because there are cases where bunch type grasses can be harvested by saw. How do you think they do it? Yeah, they lay a, a net down, a plastic net down, plant into that net, and then harvest below the net so that the net actually holds the, the, the plant community together. So it's not the, because they don't have any rhizomes or stolons to hold it together. They literally harvest the net as part of that sod and transplant. You don't want any plastic net like that to ever be in any surface where you've got athletic activity of any sort. I don't care if it's equestrian, human, whatever. Whatever they say about them breaking down over time and disappearing and being biodegradable, good luck. It's not going to happen in a time that's really functional for the use of that site. And when they're sure, if those plastic nets are exposed to solar radiation, they can break down relatively quickly, but they're usually buried in the soil and they will stay there for a long time. And then they become a safety hazard because when you wear through the top of the canopy to where that net's exposed, now your cleats are catching on it or the hooves of the horses are catching on it and you've got a safety risk. So you don't want to use netted uh, sod in anywhere where you're going to be using it for athletic type purposes, but it can be a way to get a very specific type of plant that may not otherwise be available by sod grown and transplanted into an area. I mentioned the plastic net and I will probably say this again when we get into establishment, when they harvest big roll sod, you've probably seen you know, like athletic fields where they, you know, they'll show them rolling the sod out on the grass. Roadsides, they typically harvest the hay of grass, and roll it up in big rolls and, and lay it out on the grass. As part of the harvesting procedure, they put a net on that sod in that roll. It's part of, it's added during harvest. In most cases, and, and really in every case, in my, my opinion, although this doesn't happen, that net should be removed when you lay the sod back down. And it's as easy as just having somebody walk in front of that roll and just gather it up as the sod is rolling out on the ground because you don't want it to be buried there. How many of you have ever been out to Sweetwater Reserve on the south side of town? I know exactly. So when they constructed Sweetwater Reserve, probably six or eight, or actually might even be eight or 10 years ago, they sodded all of the walkways along the there. And they put the sod down and didn't pull the net off of the hair grass sod. And I don't know if it's still a problem because I haven't been out there in a few years, but they literally had teams of volunteers going out there, cutting out the net that was becoming exposed because the wildlife were getting caught in. Like when it would rain, all of the like under part just like slid down into the wetlands. And so it was just like, like floating in the lake. Like it just like completely flew out. Right. So it, it should, that's not, there, there, there's really no excuse for it to be left on there. It should have been removed, but it wasn't. And another example, separate from athletic fields or something like that, where it should have been removed. Let's stop there for today. Um, questions about anything for now? If not, we'll pick up on, at this point on Friday. All right. Julia, Alejandra, Patrick, any questions? No, no, Dr. Cruz, thank you. No. All right, thanks, you guys. Thank you. Are you going to post like a PDF of these slides on your? Yes, um... I, I will post. When I get the Canvas site up, I will post the PDF of the slides. And I'll try to have those available for you for upcoming lectures as well before we have lectures. And like, do you have like um, potentially like a, I was wondering, like a notes page that you use to talk instead of like actual PowerPoint slides? Because I feel like some of the information you're giving here would be really easy to digest that way. Say that again, Patrick. Like, do you have um, just like a notes sheet describing the content of the slides as opposed to just printouts of the slides? I don't. OK, it's no just, big deal. I just, I just thought talk, I was Yeah, I just talked from the slides. Oh, yeah, no, it's perfect. That's not but, a big deal. But I can get you the slides so that you can make notes and not have to try to decide what content to capture. Yeah, that'd be really cool because you have yeah. they're really dense and they're useful to know. Yeah. All right, I thanks. Can do that. All right, you guys have a good afternoon. You too. Thank you. Yep.